my name is Seamus Farrell. Um, I'm a researcher in DCU, um, studying radical media um, as a PhD. I'm also an activist, so I interact with media in that regard um, in housing, particularly in Dublin. Um, we have a really good panel here today, and I'm going to let them introduce themselves, um, if possible, uh, who you are, what you're involved in, and what it is, and why you got involved in um, your line of work um, around media. So those are the three little bits of questions introduced for the room, if possible. Uh, my name is Darren McHugh. Uh, in my spare time, I'm uh, an editor of uh, Look Left magazine. Uh, Theory, a, uh, once every two months, uh, left wing magazine in practice is more like quarterly. And uh, I'm doing it because I, <laughs> I think it's good, uh, we need, um, it's good to have a, a sensible and approachable um, uh, source of left wing news, views, and uh, uh, policy alternatives. But I, I don't think they get they don't get that much uh, outing in the mainstream press, and it's good to uh, it's good to have some some way of bringing them together and presenting them and opening up uh, intra left debate, and then also as well as debating with the mainstream. Thanks, sir. Yeah, so I'm James. I'm involved in a project called Ravel. Um, Obsessively, or whatever, sorry, it's kind of a print publication. It's what our aim. And raising debt is, but um, we do a lot of kind of content aggregation online using Facebook and Twitter, uh, some blogging. Uh, we run a lot of events to fund the project, and um, probably been about five years. We tend to print around 10,000 copies. Uh, our aim is quarterly, but due to various circumstances like people's lives or work, it's tend to be around more like kind of maybe every six months now. Um, yeah, I have a background in indie media as well in the early 2000s, and I've worked in community television too. So I'm pretty much new from the block here. Um, my name is Tim McNally. I'm the co-founder and political editor of The Last Round, which is a Belfast-based uh, left-wing publication. I uh, got into it in my spare time because uh, in Northern Ireland we don't have anything of the left when it comes to media. Uh, we just have very, very right-wing press. So that's pretty much why I got into it. Before that, I was a conflict photographer. Hi, uh, I'm Dara Quigley. Uh, I write for the Dublin Enquirer now. Um, although I started out as a blogger and I suppose I just started, I was a voice that emerged from the water protest um, and that was why I started was because like that I was just frustrated with the coverage around the protests and uh, obviously the, uh, the, state, like, the attacks on the, like, the protesters themselves. Um, so yeah, for those reasons and because uh, I've the area I'm from is like a punk Kulak and I grew up in Darndale so you could see that it was a very deliberate attempt to try and push us back to the 80s and further so there was a, you know a, an element of urgency as well and there's a huge element of urgency to a lot of what I do I suppose for me because these topics of like inequality, poverty, these are all very real and you know they're things we live with day to day. Uh, and I know it probably falls in self self parody at some points, but uh, you know this is, it is why I got into it in the first place was to highlight these issues that weren't really being highlighted. So great, So there's kind of a quite diverse um, group in some regards, and also shows maybe a little bit kind of the frag how fragmented as well radical press or yeah. anything alternative is here. So we have blog and columnist writer. We have a new publication in Belfast. We have a left uh, publication, and which has been around how many years have you been going uh, look left? Uh, Rabble, I think it's about five years. Five years, Rabble, how long has it been? Sorry, sorry, not Rabble, look left. <laughs> I get confused. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, I think they kind of started around the same time. So they've started around the same time, probably different trajectories. But um, so the first question I really want to ask after the introduction is more practical question. Um, how are, is your medias or media uh, structured? Um, and thinking towards people in the room who might be co students coming through and interested in radical media alternatives, and what challenges are you facing um, with those structures, be they finance, or uh, workload, or uh, content, or anything like that? Whoever wants to get started on that difficult question, can go yeah. ahead. Do you want to try and be a bit more specific in the question? <laughs> um, yeah, so. <laughs> I think it'd be I think it'd be nice maybe because people might be involved or know 
um, the inner workings of some of your publications. Um, how, are, how do they structure themselves? What are the challenges they're facing, be it money, or, um, or how you structure your own work, or what content you choose? What challenges do you face in that? Um, finance and money, I think, are a very easy, simple one to say is a challenge. But you can take whichever direction you want on that. Um, okay, so internally, basically, there's probably about maybe, if, you, if you're putting out a print issue, there's no ream of people involved, so there's a nuclei of maybe about five or six people that are active in terms of uh, seeking content, coordinating with illustrators, there's probably two or three people on layout. Um, structurally, in terms of like it being a democratic project, it's very much like an affinity group. Uh, back in indie media in the day, there was a term called uh, dictatorship of the doers. That probably applies to Ravel as well, where a lot of what we do is by consensus, but there's loads of brilliant ideas thrown against a whiteboard and they never reach um, execution because basically people get busy with something else or the idea falls by the wayside. Um, so that's probably the reality of how it runs on the inside. Uh, that's problematic because it means we kind of get stuck in stasis where like we can achieve particular aims, but we find it hard to bring other people on board. So we get tons of people looking to do job bridge with us, ironically enough which uh, we'd love to facilitate, obviously, but we can't because we've no real uh, structure to, say, manage an intern. I'm taking the piss about job bridge, by the way. <laughs> but we do get like the students looking to do part-time placements with us, and it's like, well, none of us are on wages, so how are we going to entertain some you know, 19-year-old or whatever who wants to come out and hang out for the day? It's, it's unfeasible. Like. So that's, that's kind of a wall we've hit, because we, kind of, uh, we always kind of uh, made a, basically a virtue of, kind of the volunteerism of it, but in the long term, it actually that's kind of handicapped us, and that's kind of something we're looking at at the minute. Uh, we use a lot of kind of digital uh, digital work, or digital office space, project management apps like Basecamp, Trello, Slack, and things like that to kind of keep it rolling in between real life conversations. Uh, financially, our model was crowdfunding. We did a funded campaign and raised about 10 grand a number of years ago. Uh, that gave us enough costs to continue doing print runs. We also <laughs> were lucky to stumble into a thing in England uh, called the Workers' Beer Company, which was set up after uh, the miners' strike by, I think, the Battersea, or I think it's, yeah, basically, do you know the name of the place? I think it's ba the Battersea Trade Union Council. And what that does is it basically farms out volunteers to festivals who work uh, the taps, pulling beer, and their wages go to uh, projects that they are recruited for. So the abortion rights campaign does that here, we do that here, and that's kind of given us a lot of financial security. Um, yeah, we get a lot of donations as well, we sell merch and we organise parties, and the finances of the project, if you ignore wages, are actually surprisingly easy. But once wages come into it, you've probably got like a wall staring in front of you that you'll crash and burn into, um, because wages are probably the biggest cost of any project. Do you want to go to other, as a new... Um, what challenges you Luckily, we've uh, instilled the spirit of volunteerism starting off, so finance isn't that much of a problem, but it's very quickly becoming a problem because we're online only at the moment, but we do want to go into print. Um, we do, like, in terms of fundraising, we're looking at doing crowdfunding. Uh, we do want to place a focus on offline events because the left in Belfast is a bit scattered, and the, the whole emphasis of the project is to bring the left together not in a lovey dovey let's all hug each other and get our differences away, but uh, making, making uh, connections between people that wouldn't necessarily exist, like trade unionists and environmentalists, uh, connections that got there, that uh, would be nice to happen in meetings, but they don't always happen, because left wing meetings tend to go the same way all the time. But uh, the idea is to make those connections so that campaigns can strengthen themselves, and so the publication isn't just a media form, but it's also a communication hub as well which is why a lot of our content tends to be publicised in events rather than just views and analysis. Uh, we, don't, we don't pay wages at the moment. Uh, we'll pay expenses where we can, usually out of my own salary. So uh, I try to keep that low. But um, yeah, finance is the biggest stonewall um, after people's own work ethic. Like, uh, I think it's interesting that a theme that's came up repeatedly in the sessions today is precarity because about 75% of the people who would produce content for me are on zero hour contracts. And that is a pain in the hole. Because people who are on permanent contracts who know their hours can schedule when they're going to do the work. They always deliver on time. Whereas people who come up with great ideas get stonewalled by their employer. 
because their employer just decides last minute to call them in. And there's non-compete con uh, non -compete clauses and stuff in these contracts as well, so you can't take out another zero hours contract uh, to try and make up the wages. So um, that's uh, one other difficulty that we've been having really as well. Sorry, I had a, what problems, challenges, finance or structure or anything for anything? Um, so look left is uh, different to Rabble and I think the last round that actually, um, it does sell itself uh, commercially. Um, I would say it. so uh, we're l uh, largely funded through that and then also to the support of uh, trade unions who take out advertisements and we've had some, uh, some advertisements taken out by uh, uh, private, uh, private companies as well, uh, not not that often, unfortunately. Um, so um, then the structure, it's it's sort of volunteer, it's kind of volunteers, but there's an uh, there is in theory an editorial uh, board, but uh, in practice there's uh, I would say two to three uh, editors um, uh, varying on the time, and then there's a lot of conversations and meet ups which. Uh, don't really follow a formal pattern, unfortunately. Um, people are fitting it in, in around their working lives, so that would be like a lunchtime meeting or an after work meeting or, um, or something like that. Um, then, so the, uh, it's sort of um, uh, a power law in, term, in terms of activity. Um, you, you would have a certain amount of people who are putting in um, lots and lots of hours working on it every day. Uh, all the time, and then you would have um, a larger group of people who would uh, maybe <coughs> contribute an article or contribute quotes or, and uh, do things like that, um, which uh, the, the long tail. Okay. Dara, I know you're probably coming from a slightly different mm. perspective as freelance yeah. blogging, and but what are those challenges you're facing in that? Yeah, well, well, we've, even in the inquiry, uh, we've only got the one new, ki new kilos as opposed to a couple of new kilos. Uh, but uh, yeah, Donna, like we are obviously we're looking for funding at the moment in terms in terms of people like what, signing up and getting themselves subscriptions, and we need that just I mean to keep going, and uh, we will we will we will, we will be releasing for information next month. So there is I'm sure there's huge amounts of complications from that that I am um, kept well well insulated from. So uh, unfortunately, I can't really honor that. But with on the blogging front, it's really travel expenses, you know, and that kind of like uh, <coughs> geographical exclusion, I suppose. Like even coming down to this grant brings some that will be reimbursed, but you know, it assumes that you can pay up front, you know, and a lot of us it will take you know a month's budget in just to be able to get down here, uh, you know. So that's that's a problem, and you know, when I went down to Kilkenny, economics, obviously that's a massive problem. Chris <coughs> Fianna Fáil. Financial advisors don't, you know, do want to make fancy hotels and they could spend about a ten hour on a dinner or on a coffee. You know? So uh, yeah, we I rely hugely in those cases on like just the kindness of strangers and not just strangers. Uh, so it's all the kindness of finance or just donations <coughs> for people. Okay. Um. So, uh. But but not not other problems. I mean, you just you write, you put it up, like, it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. That's great. Um, I'm just wondering, two points that have been raised which have come across some of the trends about this core of, when there's this kind of voluntary model, mostly there's kind of a core of people doing it in a wider layer. And does that throw up problems of whose voices, what people are involved, what type of content is produced, do people think on the panel? And just stack them, anyone who wants to go with that. <coughs> yeah, I'll jump in. Uh, definitely, it, is, uh, it does draw up issues. Uh, for us in particular, we're dealing with the fact that the, the left isn't just divided by uh, ideological differences, but there's also a sectarian divide as well. Yeah. So we have to deal with how to approach uh, sensitive topic issues such as the East Horizon and the centenary of the Somme uh, with uh, members of like uh, left Republican groups, but also the PDP, who are the political wing of the UDF, and are a lovely bunch of lads. Um, so that these, these are things you deal with in the day to day. Um, in terms of our structure, uh, there's, uh, there was three editors, but one of them resigned because he's writing a novel. Not even joking. Uh, <laughs> so there's me and there's another fellow who handles the culture side of the publication and I just sort of let him do what he wants. Uh, for me, 
Uh, we have meetings where people can come and contribute ideas, they can email them in. They've got more ways to contribute ideas than they actually contribute. But uh, we're dealing with issues where it's, it's, it's sort of really the echo chambers where the people who come in are generally people that we know. And like, uh, I'll be upfront, I'm a member of the Socialist Party, so a lot of the people who come to me with, with con of, uh, content ideas are members of the Socialist Party, which for me is someone who wants to have a party of the uh, ideology like, uh, is an issue which I've had to deal with. Um, there's also an interesting divide in how uh, there's a gender divide in, con in co contribution as well. Uh, we've been fortunate enough in that we've been able to maintain about a 55-45 balance between uh, female and male contributors. Uh, but it, it gets difficult, and I think it's it's very it's very patriarchal because uh, there's a self, there's self confidence involved in writing, and uh, women come forward with great great ideas, but uh, for some reason something clicks and it just doesn't come through, uh, regardless of the support that we're able to provide, which is why we're changing our structure to have a diversity editor to see if we can change that. Okay, Mr. Investor, just do you want to dial uh, something down? Yeah. Yeah, I, th I think if you've got uh, a small amount of people uh, who are working very closely together and producing content, yes, it's naturally going to lead to a bit of an echo chamber. Um, certainly, you put that, that that can happen, as, but it depends. There's always, uh, because you have that wider layer of people, there'll be a combination of uh, push and pull. So sometimes people will say to you, hey, I've got an idea, or I know someone who's got an idea. and uh, you know, we usually say great, brilliant, and uh, if you can get it, help them and get it, get it through, that's that's great. Uh, so it depends. It, it, it varies <coughs> up and down from, from, from issue to issue about um, whether what's more prevalent, whether it's uh, people pushing at you and saying, "I've got an idea, um, can I help out?" Or, you know, um, and stuff like that, or then the more um, traditional commissioning, where you say, "Oh, can you do this? Can you do this? Can you do this?" In which case, that issue of an echo chamber is going to reproduce itself more, yeah. and more obviously. Um, Dara, how do you, how are you finding that in terms of um, more as a blogger and kind of doing freelancer mm. writing pieces? Yeah, I suppose uh, we had this conversation at lunch a little bit uh, about self selection, and that is something that you know I'm kind of aware of. And obviously, the two two women that have recently taken on board, or well, tried to get on board. Are both from similar backgrounds as myself, and you know we're working with people from the traveling community as well, trying to just use the blog as a platform now that we're getting more, now that we're getting more popular for you know other voices, not just women. Um, so, but at the same time, you know, uh, I suppose those two choices that I told you about, where uh, just this guy I was talking to, he. Runs uh, Rory Sutherland, runs an ad agency, and uh, he like tries to uh, prevent against like you know uh, self selection and you know have, having too many of the same type of person by asking two questions like whether you've been skiing or you've ever had a horse that was kept in a private stable. Those are both you know definite like uh, indicators of privilege. So. Uh, he only takes 50% of people who've had either of those experiences, which is cool. So I kind of think of it the opposite way, where I'm actually kind of looking for the writer who would have had one of those experiences, so that we could, you know, not just, like, have one, you know, like, extreme, because obviously at the moment, like, everybody who's writing there is, like, you know, on the go, or a lone parent has, you know, like, but we'd kind of also like to get the other side as well, you know, like, that, you know, uh, we obviously, um, yeah, I think we kind of have a discipline with the magazine as a print product that we kind of wanted to at least appear around it. So that means like we kind of chase content. So one of those items may be based on say environmentalism. We were kind of traditionally pretty weak on perhaps, but then we kind of realized we've done lots of stuff on Rossport maybe. Um, yeah, so I think having a print magazine that you kind of have a template for it, you can kind of play around with that and kind of correct imbalances and invite people in to offset it from one issue to the next. So it's something we pay attention to. Um, yeah, and obviously the people, there's two kind of modes of people that come to you with ideas. There's people, there's people who just kind of shoot ideas at you that never really lead anywhere. That can be a bit kind of draining and tiring. 
and then there's sort of people who it's usually more kind of silent vessels who might mention something and then you'll ask them to deliver on it and they'll yeah deliver a bombshell really with it um, our net is quite quite wide we probably get like multiple people contacting us every week with content ideas and um, a lot of them will lead to nowhere or it'll lead to content that we don't really want to go near and um, we try and follow a template like we'd expect people to go get quotes to try and play into a rabble style sheet or whatever because that's you know you're right it's a publication really yeah. um, and that can be probably a bit off-putting for people as well um, if they don't like being edited or they think that that's silly or something and what so, is that selection process or that kind of content um, it's just emails come in and we look at them and we tally back with them and then something comes from it comes from it it doesn't it doesn't you know it gets passed around among yeah. three or four people that's really it and was it a very explicit decision to start off with a certain style or was it developing over time uh, like yeah well, the style was always irreverent you know yeah. um basically um yeah we didn't want to do a traditional left wing thing like look left we didn't want to do the kind of you know here's a nice burrito shop uh journalism of toby dublin um, a lot of people involved wanted to kind of use their illustrative capacity to do kind of rollicky satire. Um, yeah, I personally don't have much interest in doing straight news reporting as a form of journalism. There's probably enough people out there doing that. Um, we actually have an internal phrase uh, called uh, ball bagging, where if we get an article and it's kind of straight laced, we ball bag it. For example, if they mention a politician in it, we'll, we'll change it to ball bag, you know. Like so instead of going like Minister Noon and we'll go that ball back Noon and it's, it's that kind of play with, play with language yeah. that I think has led people to respond to maybe rabble in a way that they don't with other publications. So it's quite a bit. Yeah, no, I think that's a lot you know, as we've developed as far as like we've gotten more like, professional as well as holding down like, you know, perhaps I would think that's the way of making that sort of stuff. And you, and you can like start out like so I think that, that does appeal to people. Because we don't really have a tradition in Ireland, like we didn't have a spit you know what I mean? Like you don't have Charlie Brooker, we don't have Frankie Boyle, we've nobody like that. You know, and you can see why because like the label us are just ridiculous. You know, so uh, it we yeah, it's cute. We did uh, what was the best does a good job, but, you know, we did really need something that's actively attacking the status quo, like, you know, in a you know, intelligent way. <laughs> yeah. And you guys are doing a good job. Um, I just wonder, that's it's really a really interesting <coughs> conversation on style and the problems with structure and and even getting back to finance and the walls that are there. And um, Tyler, you raised a thing about which seemed to indicate you felt that your publication helped to organize to a certain extent or was focused on bringing activists and people together. Um, do you think that that's the role of media or radical press to do that? Um, and yeah, just to maybe develop that a bit. Um, yeah, well, it, it's a, the offline events are, it's a process that's ongoing and we're looking to see what works and what doesn't. But um, I think personally at the moment, uh, with the technology that's available, with the ability to access an audience pretty much like never before without print, um, I think it's, it's a good time to question what a publication should do, uh, what's the role of a publication in a society. Like, uh, the reason, one of the main reasons why we're pushing for this idea of the offline and for bringing people together is because like, if you've ever watched any Northern Ireland news production, like Stephen Nolan for example, any form of journalism in Northern Ireland, it is shite, it is terrible, it is really, really bad. Um, I can't emphasize how bad enough it is. The Belfast <laughs> Telegraph is the most bought daily in Northern Ireland. Right? <coughs> this is a paper that in 2016 thinks a priest talking about a promiscuity crisis in under 24s is front page news. <laughs> it, thinks of faith, it, it thinks a faith healing debate is when uh, it publishes a front page about how faith healing is amazing. Everyone goes nuts and they think that's a debate. <laughs> like, this is the quality of, uh, of journalism in Northern Ireland and it's incredibly right wing. It's, it supports the status quo. There's nothing that attack and invest in I for uh, tax subsidies, corporation tax cuts, uh, pumping millions into the economy, which ends up in call centers where I work, which are shite. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, it's having a publication that can launch those attacks, that can get those ideas going, because in the North, we have a growing generation now. People who are born after the Good Friday Agreement was signed, who are opposed to austerity, who are opposed to sectarianism, 
they want abortion rights, they want equal marriage, but there's there's no media outlet there for them. Like there's no, there's nowhere there's no media outlet that is independent, that is uh, broad in the in the sense of the left. So it's not enough to just publish material. You need to bring people in physically, so that you can develop this idea of a community hub. So you have people being turned into activists. Like I'm not trying to suggest that the last round is Belfast Pravda, but uh, maybe that wouldn't be a bad thing. Uh, so it's, it's an educational thing as well, which is why something that I spend a lot of time thinking about, just with the people I end up working with on this, is just the role of the publication. And I think it's something that everyone should consider, regardless of what yeah. they're doing. Definitely. To uh, Dara, Dara, have anything they want to come in on that? Then we might open that to the floor after that. Uh, I suppose like with the issues you guys are facing with regard to sectarianism are similar to what we're having in that like, you know, I <coughs> like sectarianism but uh, um, we've a massive influx, you know, of new people coming in recently. Um, so I guess, yeah, you've got the established cultural resistance to say, you know, like, you know, these guys are saying like we all know each other, you know, and that's fair enough. For He's got a lot of views, you know, like, that, and suddenly just a few people pop up and, you know, we're like saying, hey, you know, we want to be involved too, but, you know, people are, you know, but, um, that, and that's great and all, but, so I suppose you kind of have two cultures now, this is in Slave, where there's this new one that's just kind of finding its own feet and figuring out who it is, so you, I suppose, kind of finding its own voice as well. Um, and, yeah, we're going to have to find a way for these two cultures to merge more people they work together. Uh, and that's going to involve like, looking at ourselves like, quite honestly and like, just, you know, just being aware that like, we're all human beings. We have failings and that's okay. <laughs> like, it's no big deal. Like, we can, we're, we're all after the same thing. So, you know. Great. Does anyone have any, at this point, some questions for the panelists? Throwback on um, what they've introduced as their media? Maybe if they want to know more about that, <coughs> about the questions I've raised about structures and problems they're facing, be it the finance, uh, the issue of the volunteerism, um, the labour involved, and um, what content gets produced. Although I'd like to add, though, um, although there's a lot of challenges, like in not having any money and trying to do this stuff for free, it also forces you to be quite innovative, like in that. You know, I, I was just so frustrated at the level of journalism even before I started writing, like, they, uh, you know, I tried to just, I, I just bullied David Williams on Twitter for about two years, until, <laughs> or for about a year until, like, uh, I called him an officer class conventional wisdom maker until he wrote an article about the officer class and conventional wisdom. <laughs> I was like, that's great. And now we have a little bit of a, a back and forth, which is, is great. Like, so, um, you know, that's just one person with a laptop is able to, you know, like have some sort of an impact on the, the like narrative and a right wing narrative, which is, uh, you know, like that's that's great. And even uh, designing the blog and that obviously be very creative and just you know a lot of time. But uh, you know, so there are downsides. But there's also, you know, you. you you end up, you know, finding new ways of getting at people. And you have to remember, like, these right-wing people, like, you know, they're not bad people. It's just, like, the whatever whatever messages are surrounded by that reinforce that type of thinking and behavior. Like, you know, they're still human beings at the end of the day. You know, you can appeal to the humanity, you know. And, like, yeah. You, sh you just happen to be a guy who likes to appear so awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, just coming there at the back. Uh, I'm interested, first of all, I'm a huge fan of both Look Left and Red, like they're fantastic publications and they're doing some really good work respectively. I must check out <coughs> some other publications. Um, as someone who is uh, very left-wing and also a journalist, um, are you really interested in this question of the tension between, in terms of style, between accessibility and thoroughness? So between, the, you know, trying to be as accessible for the mainstream or as accessible for your average kind of viewer as possible, um, but then the question of does that turn into you know this week Kim Kardashian reads Rosa Luxemburg, or you know on the other end where you've got a magazine where you know no working class person is going to pick up a forty page thesis on dialectics and hybridity and the work of the situationists. So, so is is there kind of a, a balance that has to be struck between between those two extremes in terms of 
creating a Lexus press that is both printable and thorough, but also accessible for working class people? Yeah. Let's take that question around <coughs> since it's a big question. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then we'll pull maybe one or two questions together and do it that way. Just wondering, whoever wants to come back on that, go ahead first and be brave. On. And that was another reason I started the blog, uh, was people like you, who kept telling me that uh, you had to write for the working class in tabloid form, because that's all we can understand. That's as far as we go. You know, but uh, really how I got educated was reading Marxist blogs like Hard Knife. Uh, I spent, like, I went through his entire back catalog, uh, there's your podcast, which I listened to, like, oh, no, it wasn't you, no, oh, sorry, <laughs> I got confused again. Uh, Julian's podcast, uh, who I listened to, like, religiously, uh, with a group of friends, and, like, just shushing everybody in the room as we were listening to academics describe how framing, uh, like, how framing works in Tunisia. Yeah all of these things. So, you know, working class people aren't stupid. You know, and we are educating ourselves. We're well able to educate ourselves and each other and speak for, for ourselves and each other. You know, we, we can do that, you know. <laughs> We're not idiots. Uh, so that was uh, a big, you know, a big uh, motivator as well for starting the blog was uh, not to introduce these concepts. Like, I think a lot of the problem as well, like, it's just language, you know, like, we use there's a dialect, we, you know, we speak in a dialect and, uh, you know, and we don't understand the, okay, every specialization has its own language, has its own little dialect, like, I mean, you can't expect everyone to speak yours either, like, you know, um, so it's, you know, I mean, yeah, there was a bit of a, an experiment there, I suppose, in trying to translate the ideas, and it worked, and, uh, you know, uh, people didn't have any trouble following <coughs> this at all, like, and you know what we were describing was, you know, what the presentation had just come from, which was, you know, how uh, market ideology dominates, you know, so, so not just the media, but how that's filtered through into how we view each other uh, and how we view ourselves, you know, like that. You, uh, there's no like social effects, you know. Everything we do, everything that happens, is we made that happen. So do, Sorry, you, yeah. <laughs> do you think there at the end that the accessibility versus quality content is a bit overplayed and overdone as a divide? Oh, I don't know what that means. So do you think that, so when, um, when you make the point about there's being like a tabloid newspaper or just oh, being yeah, high yeah, quality yeah. theoretical content, but that d dividing oh, yeah, line is yeah, overplayed obviously. sometimes? Yeah, yeah, probably. Like, right? I don't, yeah, there's, yeah, obviously, like, you don't have, it doesn't have to be one or the other, like, it's not black or white. Um, and I think this is part of that ideology is that it's you know it's full on it's full off you know there's everything's a spectrum you know? so uh, <laughs> if you're, if you're looking at like either ends of you're looking at two extremes here where most people are going to not be at the extremes so uh, yeah like go more towards the middle <laughs> or like then like, not politically but just like <laughs> as you were writing like you know like. Uh, like the blog did, which was you know, take elements of working class culture that are, you know, appearing to both like the uh, both sides, and uh, you know, uh, yeah, just use a lot of images and then try to highlight the cool aspects of it and the creative aspects as yeah. well of the culture. So in a way, you're educating uh, people who aren't from that culture too. Yeah. But um, I don't know. So Does anyone else want to comment on that kind of that question? Say, um, I, I think one, one of our aims with Book Left is to, to make it uh, accessible, and it's not, um, it's certainly not dumbing it down in, in any way, I don't think, or I hope not. Um, but um, like, I think there is a tendency among um, people from the left, kind of often come from uh, 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 two, two styles of writing, I, I find, uh, well, like maybe two or three. Um, uh, one of which is very academic, uh, one of which is kind of, um, kind of very activist and is, is kind of uh, maybe a little bit over poetic. And um, <coughs> then there's a confessional style, which is kind of increasingly common because of blogging. And um, the, uh, I think I, uh, I, I, I'm generally responsible for the sub editing of Look Left. And um, uh, I, you know, I, I try, I, I don't know if, you, if there's a term for the style we, we have, but it's, 
It tries to be accessible, uh, to reduce the uh, complexity of the sentences, uh, to make it read well, um, but not in any way to dumb down uh, the ideas. Uh, um, but uh, yeah, if, if people are talking too much, sometimes you need to cut a few sentences as well. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, actually, on that note, I'll stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think it's an interesting question. I think uh, Dara's going to nail it there about writing styles on the left. Um, there's clearly the academia one as well. Um, with, with Rabble, like, I mean, there's, there's reference points for it before in the past, and the, the notion that you can't have, you know, you can't imagine anything between, I don't know, the sun and the book and dialectics is kind of, it just shows how eroded and far away we are from yeah. maybe some of the better and bigger movements in the past. But, I mean, I'd, I'd be highly influenced by the industrial workers' world with Rabble. I mean, our character is kind of based on Mr. Blockhead, you know? Um, you know, they kind of had their Marxism in overalls, as they call it. They were able to create memes that could carry on railway tracks, you know, from migrant camp to migrant camp and convey very radical ideas in very, very simple forms. Um, if we're having trouble doing that today, it's probably something we should really start looking at. Um, yeah, and we're probably fairly... In, ter in terms of how we gauge our style and so on, we try and really encourage people to include voice because I think people respond to voice. So, you know, we don't really like opinion pieces because they're a bit confessional or academe. But, you know, if you can go out and talk to somebody who's campaigning on queer issues and maybe leave the academic element of it at home and try and weave it in some way, then that probably works for us and our readership. Like, you know, it just makes it more accessible. People identify with each other. They don't really identify with tomes and dialectics. But if you can express it in a little sharp... Uh, three block cartoon, you're probably doing the world a favour. I have two rules, uh, no waffle and no bullshit. Uh, some of the people who contribute to us uh, seem to come from the very academic end of the scale. And uh, because we are, most of our audience is age 18 to 24 and they're not engaged in um, Marxist politics, so having someone write with a lot of academic language is useless, like, uh, it's like a chocolate teapot. So like, what we try to do is, because uh, we don't believe that working class people are, are inherently stupid, like it's ridiculous, it's bollocks, like. but uh, Sorry. really um, what we try to do is have pieces that contain the content that's necessary. So um, if you need to include a term like neoliberalism, you do. But uh, you don't have necessarily overly wordy sentences because it does need to read well because like people have to actually read this stuff. So for us, it's about trying to find a balance between having the accessibility of the lexicon and uh, having the actual quality of analysis behind it as well. Any other questions it, coming? Um, yeah, uh, just on that, it's just, it's all about exclusion anyway because I mean. Um, the academic language, in a way, is, is basically just to justify the fact that you've got a PhD. Into, you know, it, it's yeah, kind of it's not to do anything with intelligence, and that but it goes back to like, the sort of who really know what about doing voluntary work and stuff like that. Do it at your own time. But again, it, like this exclusion. I mean, like for example, I mean because I've travelled here, I, like, I haven't had a meal today, and there's many of these I've not had a meal. And I mean that's a university that can put like. Um, Actually, nice and fucking paddling pools, but yeah, anyway, yeah, yeah, <laughs> not big yeah. students, whatever. <laughs> like, um, it becomes unsustainable. Like, you know, you can have this voice and this strong voice, but like, like I'm gonna say before, but eventually, eventually, it'll bring you onto your knees. You know what I mean? And you have to like moderate yourself or something, and it's about so any independent voice ultimately, like, ultimately, like, you're gonna get you get crushed by the pressures of it because how long can you live on the you know, the great to God and the favors of friends? You know what I mean? And friends, things are strangers, like, and I've done that, but it, 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 it's, it's horrible, like, but um, it's excluding me, like, <coughs> like you, it's really hard to have an independent voice, like, and that's your challenge, isn't it? How are you going to rise to the challenge? Yeah, I was going to ask that, so is the, is the kind of volunteerism, is that sustainable, and is it also a bit, we've got, looked at the question of exclusion before, is it kind of exclusionary as well? Is it sustainable in the future, do you think, is a big question itself? I was pushing to the whole end of the conversation yeah. in the middle, but like, let's just throw it in here now. Yeah, I, I think it's kind of crazy, basically. Like, this is an academic conference with media, um, and the structural issue comes up again and again and again. I mean, there's whole swathes of Irish society ran on, you know, amateurism, voluntarism, 
where there's resources put into the hands of people to carry out things without huge or great rewards, um, but they're effectual, like the GAA. Um, it's just, I kind of, I, I think probably now more than ever, there's probably, it's probably easier to have highly distributed workloads, micro-tasking, all these kind of things, uh, crowdfunding, being on a permanent war foot with crowdfunding as well, um, that's highly achievable. I mean, people keep referencing Glenn Greenwald, he's doing that, but it's almost like the message hasn't really caught on in Ireland, um, that that is possible. Um, I mean, we are highly fragmented. I just, um, I mean, Vincent Brown was trying to raise, what was it, 50 grand or something a few years ago? Five million. Five million, was it? <laughs> <laughs> Five million seems like a ludicrous amount of money, like, but I mean, is it really impossible to do that? If, is it? Yes. Is it? <laughs> in three weeks, yeah. In two weeks, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Try to do it in three weeks, like, was he okay? Right, well, I mean, like, documentary makers do it the whole time. I mean, your man, Russ Charlotte or Donneville, or whatever his name is, who made the pipe, raised 53 grand to fund an hour and a half long documentary project. He got matching funding from two other funding sources. That it's 150 grand. It, it, it seems to be really only in journalistic circles that there's the kind of lack of optimism mm -hmm. and sort of a defeated will around the possibilities for doing stuff. Um, so Do you want to comment there, Diane? Um, I, w I wonder, uh, it might be, involuntarism might be also part of the vice of the left is, um, uh, I think left people who are, are engaged in activism are used to <coughs> Uh, working very hard and uh, doing it in their spare time and not getting any money for it. Um, I, I, I'm not sure it's sustainable. I, would, I think it would, be, it would be more sustainable to figure out a way of having uh, independent press with staff uh, on, you know, it could be a couple of part-time staff and we could still, if I think if we had two part-time staff, for instance, we could probably produce Look Left uh, monthly or, uh, or at least, you know, maybe uh, six weekly, um, and th th it would, it, 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 that's not a huge amount of money. I think it might be volunteerism becomes something that it helps you get off the ground, but it might stop you from going further because you you are reliant on it, and, and uh, it brings problems in terms of organisation. So, I, I think I think we need a we need a medium to long term uh, strategy, which is more about which in, in, involves staff. Uh, well, whether yeah, it's sustainable. I think it's uh, you know maybe things like the blog and you know luckily enough I get paid for writing for the well I don't get paid for writing for the Inquirer, but I might you know, just maybe get into something if something happens. But uh, you know, maybe people like myself and uh, general other individuals who'd be contributing to the blog and that maybe are an unintended implication of austerity. Well, definitely are an unintended implication of austerity in that you've got. Uh, relatively smart, funny, creative people with not much to do, uh, who, due to you know the levels of abject fucking poverty, poverty, can't afford to do a leader half as much, and end up talking to each other quite a bit on the internet. And you know, so we, you know, through that, you know, from that, like things have grown. You know, people have gotten educated, um, and you know, we are we're starting to see like like I think it's the start of something very potentially interesting and we saw that we saw it in pre uh, indie like the pre indie rap in Scotland um, I was watching just Facebook at the time and the level of political discourse from people who usually would have like not to do politics was incredible. Like just, you know, debating like exactly like what it meant to be a member of an autonomous republic. Like th this was back in the whole talk, you know, and like that's incredibly exciting. And, uh, you know, it, we saw it for a while in Ireland, but uh, it's faded off a bit. Yeah. <laughs> like, but we, we clearly did that couple of times, so we don't go back to it. <laughs> I just want to point maybe back a little bit that if there's the media and the, like, the sustainability <coughs> of that, I wonder if for individuals themselves, mm -hmm. if they don't have another employment, can they continue this work in 5, 10, 15 years, or do it for another 5, 10, 15, 20 years? Um, do you feel as a panelist that's... That, that comes in that defining question of is the volunteer going to work for individuals to sustain themselves as well as the media outlet could sustain itself but individuals have to sustain themselves. There's like two yeah. levels of sustainability, the media itself and the structure but also the individuals involved in it. Well if, if you have a, um, a good structure, a good organisation, uh, it should in theory be possible to survive you know, um, 
people moving on and people doing other things. Um, I think you, you need to have you, you'd have to be quite 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 serious about what that model is, what the organisation is, and um, uh, I don't I don't know if uh, if anyone's there yet mm -hmm. in terms of the uh, the left media in Ireland. Um, I think they generally are dependent on quite small groups of individuals. Um, I hope I hope that's not the case, and I hope um, or I hope other people find solutions. But I don't have any interest. Um, yeah, like I, I constantly kind of go back to there's a thing can called the Canadian Magazine Fund, mm -hmm. and basically it raises cash off the advertising that non-indigenous magazines soak up in its terrain, and it invests it in uh, basically independent publishing uh, projects within its borders. It provides stuff like free postage for subscribers. Um, yeah, it ensures free carriage and news agents so you can sell your product. I mean, I don't think any of these projects should be, uh, you know, held up by the shoulders of people who aren't getting paid. You know, there are political things and financial kind of things that you could do at the state level to create more of an open media landscape that's not really discussed all that often, you know. Um, the other thing as well, I find it's kind of like there's a constant coming back to the volunteer nature of it. Like, um, I mean, again, lots of things in Irish society are led by volunteers. Yeah. There's probably just not enough volunteers to do it. I think left wing media is a prime example of it. It's basically it's always a small cohort of people trying to pull in a direction, acting as the spokes of a wheel, um, and a lot of people just consume that or don't support it. Like I think if you want to have a strong left wing media, you need a lot of people to do it yeah. and highly defined structures that enable them to do that. And again, we live in a really, you know, linked age. There's loads of amazing software out there that would allow you to carry out projects like that, but we haven't really. I don't think there's really been an expression of a vision for it really in Ireland mm -hmm. as such so far. Um, just I think there was a Facebook row going on earlier on. If you think about the amount of hours you pour into Facebook, yeah. like if you gave even ten percent of that mm -hmm. to building alternative media, you'd be really getting somewhere pretty quick, like you know. Yeah. So our volunteer capacity is being recuperated by capitalism, you know. Yeah. So, so. I, didn't, I didn't want to pull in on that. Um, yourself. Any uh, other questions? I, I'm like growing up in a culture where I can, you know, get all the music and movies on for free. Like how, in every bit of information, I can get acting to for free. So it's it's great. I can get everything I need and you know learn what I want. But like how, is it just like it's treated like you're do volunteering and you're working doing it yourself? Is it how like financially is it feasible if? This is a culture, well, in my culture, where we get it for free, your information, like how is a question of you're going to adapt to this, you know, market, or is it just we're at the beginning now where it'll be figured out in the end how to make money from this? That's interesting, yeah. I suppose, like, uh, it, it may be right, it could actually be linked into like, the last thing about uh, people who like myself being in on the of education of austerity, like, so it's maybe. We have to see what the, how you add value to something. Mm -hmm. You know, you can you put, like that is one way of adding value is just by being more creative. Like you mm -hmm. know, and doing a, a better job than other people are offering mm -hmm. a new way of looking at the world that you're not being offered. In all the, like all this t all the stuff you get for free, it's all offering you like one new way to look at the world. Mm -hmm. You know, so I don't know. Maybe ideas are worth something again. Or like, <laughs> I don't. I am. Um, yeah, like so maybe I don't know. We we perhaps need a psychological revolution. Mm -hmm. I've said this before, more than a, a political one. And that uh, maybe the, rather than a technological revolution, the next one might be psychological, mm -hmm. and maybe that would be due to what can be added, the value that can be added without you know pre uh, uh, costing any more capital, like whatever, but without <laughs> creative capital that can be added. Does so, yeah. anyone else want to come back to that question? I think people, it's um, uh, media organizations uh, in the mainstream as well as uh, more specialist and niche press are getting uh, are making uh, getting more traction for asking the readers to pay. Um, so the Irish Times is obviously paywall now after ten articles. Um, I think the Washington Post is the same. Um, a, lot, a lot of the, bit, the big media organizations are the same. But then you also see specialist press. So, for instance, I subscribe to Pando.com, specialized in technology reporting. There's um, 
uh, it, lots of individuals who pay for um, there's a guy like for a guy called Gary Brecker who does uh, um, very uh, informed war reporting he does some podcasts um, and then he you know his, he does a patreon system where people pay him I think ten ten dollars a month um, which is quite a lot of you know it's 120 dollars a year um, and but he still manages to get enough support from that to to do the show and to live um, so I, I, I think that that issue of the kind of the early the early internet everything is free and the expectation is that everything is going to keep on being free I think the audience might be um, getting around to the perspective that you know it should be kind of yeah I would very much agree like if it is a quality product mm -hmm. you will pay for it but you know my generation we're just sort of used to we guess we can get it if we want without paying for it yeah yeah but then I mean if it's something like you know you can go into breakingnews.ie and get mm -hmm. get the headlines um, I'm not going to say you should go to the Irish Times instead because it's not a great example but um, you know, if I if I want to understand something, uh, if if there's if it's an, especially a topic that's of interest to me, I'm I'm willing to pay a little bit of money uh, for it. Not huge money. There you go, Um Just curious, to what degree do you think a, a radical and alternative press are, are influencing the mainstream news agenda, or is that even a measure of success in any way? Um, like, is, is is there an improvement in that regard in the last few years, or do you see it as just? Very cool uh, Go ahead, open. I, I I find it hard to measure. Certainly, with look left, the only I I think to survive and keep going is a measure of success because you're you're so small and you're just struggling to keep going and get something out there. Um, I think we we have seen stories picked up by the um, by the press, but they they would be reasonably. Uh, Kind of minor human interest stories. So, for instance, uh, Irving Welsh did <laughs> take a this quote saying that he supported the campaign to name what is now the Rosie Hacker Bridge as uh, the James Connolly Bridge because James Connolly, like uh, Irving Welsh, uh, was a Hibs fan. Uh, <laughs> this is, this is the, the crucial crucial aspects of political leaning. Um, and I, I, if I remember correctly, the Sunday Times or another another paper picked that up. And then, so, but, but it's really. Uh, our discernible impact has been quite minor in terms of the mainstream. Uh, I think, you know, our, our our impact in target the niche audience of people interested in left wing politics is more more discernible. It'd be nice. To, I I would certainly see you know change in the mainstream as a measure of success. I, I just don't think we're there. Yeah, I yeah, hundred percent. I mean, like I said earlier on, journalists are people. Uh, I was, you know, lucky enough uh, that your man McWilliams, he's just like, he's open to, if you come back at him, if he writes an article and, you know, you, you come back at him with a re really reasoned argument, backed up with some data, he'll pay attention, you know, and I just did it enough times that he started to listen to me and value me again. So, you know, that, you can do it, yeah, you, people, you, journalists and people do, and you can access, the, you know, they're open to ideas, and, this is the thing, is like the kind of journalist you want to get at, where the kind of person you want to get at anywhere is the type of person who is going to engage with you no matter who you are, like who's going to engage with the idea rather than the person, do you know what I mean? Would you regard yourself as a journalist? Uh, yeah, I'm a journalist, uh, that's my job, I yeah. write articles and I get paid. As in it's not a dirt, you know, just when you say kind of journalist or people too, it's, it's almost like kind of excluding yourself from the... Oh, sorry, I suppose, yeah. like, like you said, the mainstream, like, you know, or the, you know, the right, yeah, right wing press or whatever, oh. yeah, you can get at them, you know, just, just try and deal with them. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody likes being called officer class. How did you have time around the um, I, I kind of, um, I was kind of thinking about that, what stuff have we covered that may be of interest? I think there's two parts, like, we, we definitely can't play, like, the current affairs game of being first out of the trap. You know, we kind of do news aggregation by default. That's just because people are stuck at decks or like a desk in an office. You know, what more can you do? Have we had scoops? Yeah, we have. Like, I mean, um, we had British Trade Union get onto. It's about the I can't remember the name of the company now, but they were kind of running an operation where they were basically employing people in Poland and dispatching them in Atlantic England. Wing. Yeah, Atlantic Winco. And we we broke that before so many times. Could we do that every week? No. Uh, so what's our raising the lecture then is radical press. I think it's more consciousness. 
forming and shaping. I'd like to think that there's people who see, perhaps understand themselves as rabble readers, spot each other as rabble readers, and um, you know they probably have a particularly kind of skewed take on things that they might share with us as the editors. That's probably much more our game, um, rather than you know kind of popping up with something that takes down government. You know, mm -hmm. we might possibly push and encourage more people to participate in the act of taking down government, but we may not necessarily have the you know document that leads to it happening, or we won't be part of like the Panama Leaks uh, investigative unit. You know, but uh, we might tell you where the riot is happening. That's, <laughs> that's, that's pretty straight up, straight up like, I mean, we we'll do see it. ourselves as, you know, it's rabble, it's kind of mob agitation, like, you know, um, and hopefully consciousness shaking in its yeah. own right as well. Uh, we wouldn't measure our success in terms of the mainstream media outlets at all, um, yeah. mainly because yeah. it's like comparing water with steam. Um, <laughs> We would measure our success in, at the moment, just because we're new, we're only six months old, uh, in terms of how our material spreads out beyond activist circles, so we're able to use analytics and stuff to track that, and um, we get feedback the odd time from people as well. Um, apart from that, I think really, like uh, the echo people's points, uh, I think Radical Press shouldn't be measuring itself off the same instruments that the mainstream media outlets would be doing. Like. Uh, should we, we should measure our success and how they may adapt or co-opt whatever it is we do. Um, we should be measuring our success and how people generally view the mainstream press because, like, I don't yeah. call myself a journalist. I don't have anything against journalists. Like, they, they are people, but uh, <laughs> it's also them. Like, you know, um, in Northern Ireland, the mainstream press is concerned with uh, maintaining the neoliberal peace process. The last round's not concerned with that. The last round's concerned with burning it down. So, like that, that's how I see the dividing line personally uh, when it comes to viewing the mainstream press uh, compared to ourselves. I mean, I'm, not, I'm not sure whether you listened to Gemma earlier. Uh, Gemma, mm -hmm. yeah, just talking about the the outsider. You know, the idea of the journalist as outsider that has been lost. In uh, I mean, uh, you know, is, is that something that you kind of relate to that this, uh, what, what was it, Jim, this, the, the term, the, the rat and the, the, the rat like cunning and the, uh, the, just the, I guess the, 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 the journalist as somebody on the margins or on the, on, on, on the outside of things that, um, you know, it, 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 are you picking up that, that, that gauntlet in a way that, because mainstream journalists have. I, the point I was making was that, um, you know, the fleets that operate in Leinster House or the Phoenix Park, like that's what they are. They're packs, they work in packs. And mm. with a journalist, you can't do that. Because mm. like, you're never going to get your big scoop, you're never going to get your exclusive if you're working with a group. Mm. But that is the way, and they, you know, they're in there in Leinster House, they're drinking with politicians, you know, they're out after hours and they're they're far too connected. Well, they're not doing the job. They're not doing the job. And you are <laughs> sure of being an outsider. Yeah. You know, staying outside of it. And then you can report and you know, dispassionately. Dispassionately. Okay. <laughs> no, no, that's good. I, I was wondering um if everyone's talked about the content they're producing, the styles they're doing, have and you've and you've said uh James about that you have kind of broken a couple of and stories around various things, but long-term investigative journalism takes more time and resources possibly, and is that a space that maybe the radical or alternative press isn't there at yet, but is still that for mainstream, so there's a bit of a gap? Can you think on that? Um, we're doing investigative work at the moment, so we are. Um, mainly, again, because of the volunteers' nature of ourselves. It's free political parties who are willing to put in the resources that they have to give it to us. Uh, we're working with the Green Party. I'm holding my nose on that. But uh, <laughs> we're working with them because there's a gold mine in West Tyrone, uh, near where I'm from. And uh, there's been a lot of corruption and, go and other shady dealings on that they apparently have the full scoop on, which means I have to hire a barrister. But uh, <laughs> uh, we, we're working on that. We're working on. Uh, the 50-50 policing rule that was dropped from the PSNI a couple of years ago and looking at the demographic of uh, ethnicity within the PSNI at the moment as well as the fact that we're the only police force in these islands that have uh, drones as well. Um, 
it's obviously difficult without resources, but uh, there's ways of uh, getting around it. Like we would work with uh, trade unions closely, we work with political parties, campaign groups, and um, anyone who has a bit of evidence that we can correlate together and produce something on it. Anyone else want to come the investigative journalism? I wouldn't see us as having the, the resources to, to be able to do. We do get, like there are things we'll cover that no one else will cover. A, access to sources and people who want to push an issue that they're not getting traction for elsewhere, but um, I wouldn't want to, um, I, I wouldn't be so bold as to say we're, you know, cracking open the sarcophagi of power. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, I mean, do you, you, know, you do your best, or do you have to throw it in July, why not, you know, just pushing them out there as, as an guardian, you know, I don't know if it's just to name change, you know what, on, on charges, and you know, I, I don't know if I'll be able to support it or what, but you know, at least be there. Um, so, I don't know, obviously there's not much resources, but you know, you just like, play your best. <laughs> I mean, no, yeah, yeah, but yeah, just you still do it. And uh, if that's a, a skill in itself and it's something that people need to be able to do, I need to be able to do it, like how to properly research, um, even just where the information is. like. People like Colin McKay, but not, you know, there are people who need to get access to, like, you yeah. know, who can share that head, that skill with, with new people like myself. Um, yeah, I think we're, we're kind of very uh, encumbered with basically, um, yeah, I think Facebook is usually, it's a total time suck, I know it's basically like stuff like maintaining a website to time suck, you know, basically, I probably spent about two days this week trying to get like an email pop up working on a WordPress, you know, all those kind of maintenance things take away from <laughs> doing yeah. investigative journalism, you know, but, you know, if you collect emails, you might be able to do a decent crowdfunder down the line for that. We've done applications for it, we, we talk about it, you know, and um, it's just, uh, our, our, our longest article is sent to you, 1200 words in Ravel, we also have another problem that we're kind of on current, so like we could, I remember we published something about the water movement and it was probably about two months after it kind of it had just kind of, it had, it had gone past the high point as it were like, so yeah. these are all kind of difficulties we have really. Um, there's a bit of internal discussion at the minute around refocusing what we're doing and we're gonna do like a consulta uh, in the great Zapatista style of just doing a, a big survey to find out what people kind of would like to see a project like Ravel do um, over the next year or two. So I guess we'll see after that like. Okay. Any more questions for people to come in? on anything for these panelists while you have them in the room and it's a fine opportunity to question them or interrogate them or be nice. Go ahead, um, quick one, I think. As well, you guys do the job you do, what do you now reckon was the biggest mistake you ever made in your current role? There's a confessional now. Yeah, <laughs> I, I don't hear childhood stuff, we all heard that. Uh, just, like what would you, what's the biggest pitfall you'd suggest people avoid? I realise that's quite Who's in charge of the Facebook account? Who's in charge of Facebook account? I would honestly say like structure, and I, th I think Dublin Inquirer is probably, I think uh, the way they're able to express what looks like something that could have long-term growth and bring more people on. Like we, we kind of rushed to print and it was grand, you know? and buzz long for a while, but somewhere down the line you're going to face structure. Um, you know, we have no kind of business background or anything like that. Like, we, we have no legal entity behind us whatsoever. Uh, it's basically just a gang of mates doing something, but that means it's hard to bring people on. It's hard to seek funding, um, be that, like, you know, off the Arts Council, or be that through a crowdfunding campaign. Like, I think, I think you should be able to envision where you should be in five years' time from day one. Uh, you, can ma you may veer off that path, but at least if you have something to shoot towards, you'll probably make more strategic decisions. Um, I hate to go near words like social entrepreneurship or startup cultures and so on, but the left could probably do it, paying some attention to them from the point of view of how they're able to scale or just the way they can structure themselves and bring people yeah. in and so on. I mean, you know, we're just useless at it. Like, you know, it's just not our terrain. Um, I know uh, an old mate of mine is saying that the new left of you just broke lucky in the 70s because some dude who was in business school got involved for a while and <laughs> laid down the groundwork for it to kind of survive into the future. 
Like Jacobin is doing well because the editor has a really good numbers mind on him. Um, I think if you don't have that, you're probably going to hit difficulty pretty quick. Get a good numbers guy. <laughs> we don't have one. <laughs> Uh, not recording the interview with Cormac with Lucy where he explained our hotel policy and uh, hotel stays. That's one of the best pieces of that. <laughs> what The only other thing that I've been to, like this would have been kill economics where you had like a bit of a mix and that definitely would have, you know, it, it would have been a lot better if there had been some radical voices there because uh, the the people representing the government are a vested interest. They did an incredibly good job of keeping the topics on track, you know, on the right place. So definitely, I think yeah, we need more voices uh, who aren't afraid to just like stand up and say, but you know, you're whatever, you know, you have you have vested interests here. You know, we can't believe what you're saying or uh, are willing to question like whether or not uh, journalists are doing their job properly, and you know, to remind them that. Or to remind ourselves and each other that we do have a job to do and we have to hold power to account 